வணக்கம் ஸ்ரீ குருபியோ நமக அண்ட் ஜெய்ஹிந்த் எஸ் வி ஆர் ஹியர் வித் எட் அன் அதர் எடிஷன் ஆஃப் ஆசாதி கி அமிர்த் மகோத்சவ் திங்கிங் ஆஃப் ஆர் ஃப்ரீடம் ஃபைட்டர்ஸ் அண்ட் டுடே ஹோம் ஷெல் வி சி and learn about we shall start with a great man from tamil nadu this man was an ayurvedic doctor who also was a freedom fighter what was his name selam varadarajulu naidu Salem Vardarajlu Naidu was born on the 4th of June 1887. He was from an affluent family, a family which was not poverty struck and therefore could go to the school and learn well. Though he is called Salem Vardarajulu Naidu from the time he started his practice in the town of Salem in Tamil Nadu he actually was born in a neighboring town called Rasipuram at the age of 19 he was drawn to the freedom movement but much before that as he was a student in the school he was drawn to the clarion call of vande mataram and even started a small organization called the forward looking students with this organization he was able to spread the message of vande mataram and the necessity for joining up the freedom movement these kinds of activities did not go well with the school management and so he was in fact sent out of school however he continued with his education in other places and went up to become an ayurvedic doctor as he set up his practice as an ayurvedic doctor he was also attracted to the indian national congress in 1906 when he was barely 19 years of age he joined various movements which were part of the freedom struggle he became a political activist in 1916 in the same year when the harvey mills at madurai went in for a labor agitation varadarajlu joined the agitation and led from front in the fiery speech that he delivered in this agitation at the harvey mills he was arrested and then sentenced to rigorous imprisonment the reason his speech had elements of sedition subsequently vardarajlu also took up to journalism he obtained the rights of a journal or a magazine called prapanchamitran this prapanchamitran was originally started by one mr mangalam shanmugamudaliyar and then edited by yet another freedom fighter subramanya shiva subramanya shiva could not run the magazine 
and so Vardarajulu decided to procure it himself. For his writings in Prapanchamitran, which were also labelled seditious by the British authorities, he was arrested and sentenced again to rigorous imprisonment. A political prisoner should not be subjected to rigorous imprisonment or to laborious, industrious work in the jail. However, the British authorities did not stick to rules and regulations and very often subjected almost all the political prisoners to rigorous imprisonment and to industrious labour inside the jail. In this particular case, Vardarajulu decided to appeal to the High Court of Madras and he did so. At the High Court of Madras, he was represented by none other than Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya. At that point of time, Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya was known more as a lawyer, an advocate than a political activist. Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya was able to get Varadarajulu acquitted from the clutches of the case and that started a lifelong friendship between the two of them. Subsequently, Varadarajulu decided to quit his medical practice and completely plunge into the freedom struggle. He was also part of the home rule movement for some time. He believed that the Indians could rule themselves. When the temple entry agitation grew strong, Varadarajulu joined it. Temple entry agitation was a kind of a movement against some of the British rules which prevented the Dalits from entering the temples. Varadarajulu took up the cause and was part of the temple entry movement. For his fiery activities in this part of the country, that is the southern part of the country, he was even called the South Indian Tilak. Whatever Balagangadhar Tilak was able to do in the north, Varadarajulu was able to do in the south and hence this dubbed name of being called South Indian Tilak. In fact, two other associates of Varadarajulu were also called as part of the triumvirate. They were called the Southern Triumvirate, akin to the triumvirate of Baal, Pal and Lal. Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandrapal and Lala Lajapatrai. That was the triumvirate of the Indian National Congress, the triumvirate of the freedom struggle in the north isn't it? Akin to this trio, the South Indian trio also took active interest in the freedom struggle and was part of several of the independent movements. And this triumvirate consisted of Salem Varadarajulu Naidu, E. V. Ramasamy Nayakar, and Thiruvi Kalyanasundaram. Together, these three were called the Bal, Pal and Lal of the South. In 1920 or somewhere between 1919 and 1920 when Mahatma Gandhi visited Tamil Nadu, Varadarajulu met Gandhi and was much influenced by the Gandhian thoughts. Of course, between 1918-19 and 
1920, his involvement in active politics was so much that every now and then the newspapers would report of Salem Varadaraj Runaidu talking to the public and motivating them to join the freedom movement. As we have already seen, it was in 1918 that he courted arrest for the first time, subsequently in 1919 the second time and again in 1923 he courted arrest for the third time, a six month rigorous imprisonment for having made a fiery speech in one of the mass movements in Periyakulam near Madurai. When Mahatma Gandhi was imprisoned in 1922, Salem Varadaraj Lunaidu had a unique way of protesting. What did he do? He refused to pay income tax. Remember, Varadaraj Lunaidu was not an ordinary person. He was a doctor. He, heard, he had a good income and though he had left his medical practice, he belonged to a family wherein he was able to get a good income through the years. However, when Mahatma Gandhi courted arrest, Varadarajulu decided that he would not pay the income tax to the British authorities. He refused to pay the tax and subsequently he had to lose his car and his lands which were confiscated by the authorities. What kind of a sacrifice? He did not mind losing his property. So it was not that that he did not want to pay the tax because he would lose the money. He did not want to pay the tax primarily because he wanted to agitate and let the authorities know that Gandhi should not be arrested. In 1932, his involvement in journalism grew well. We have already seen that he obtained a journal called Prapanchamitran and it was his writings in Prapanchamitran that led to his arrest and subsequent acquittal in the High Court Appeal. However, he also started another journal, a weekly journal to start with called Tamil Nadu. It was Tamil Nadu in which several other Tamilians who sought employment and responsibility and made Tamil Nadu a kind of a diving board for their involvement in the independence struggle. In 1932, he jointly started the Indian Express along with another gentleman called Sadanand. However, he could not run the Indian Express and subsequently the Express was procured by Goenka. Salem Vardaraj Lunaidu was one of those early freedom fighters of Tamil Nadu. In the 1910s and 1920s, the Tamil Nadu branch of the Indian National Congress was synonymous with the name of Salem Varadarajulu Naidu. He was a very close associate of Vivo Chidambaram Pillai, Thiruvi Kalyana Sundaranar, and K. Kamaraj. The friendship between E. V. Ramaswami Nayakar and Varadarajulu Naidu knew no bounds and of course the friendship that started 
in the Prapanchamitran case and grew up was that friendship between Varadarajulu and Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya. Later on, Varadarajulu records that he crossed roads with Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya in more than one occasion. However, there were differences of opinions, but there was no hostility, there was no enmity. He would go on to record that he respected the feelings of Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya and in fact spoke to the children of a school in Salem that they should emulate the values and the features that Chakravarti Rajagopalacharya possessed. Such was that great leader, Salem Varadarajulu Naidu from Tamil Nadu. Whom shall we see next? Another man of the month of June. Can we think so? Yes. And that would be Birsa Munda. Birsa Munda was born on the 15th of November 1875 and passed away on the 9th of June 1900s. Birsa Munda was more a tribal leader. He belonged to the Munda tribe and was born in the Lohardaga district of the then presidency of Bengal. The Lohardaga district area is currently in the state of Jharkhand. Birsa had poverty struck at him at a very early age. His parents had to move from town to town seeking labor and job for the sake of bringing up the children. It also happened that Birsa was able to find out that several landlords were exploiting the tribal people. He fought for the rights of the tribal people and collectively raised the voices of the tribal people against the landlords and the British agents. For his work of consolidating the efforts and the strength of the tribal lot, he was arrested several times. In fact, price was fixed for his head. And remember, in those days, before 1900, his head was prized at a tag of rupees 500. He moved from one place to another to consolidate the efforts of the tribal people. He spoke to them, patronized them, motivated them, appraised them as to how they were being ill-treated. He had to live in the forest because the British authorities had declared a kind of a war against him. Anyone who would give information about Birsa Munda would be appropriately rewarded. And when Birsa was hiding in the Chakradarpur Jamgopal forest, intelligence reports reached the British authorities that he was somewhere in that dense area. It is easy for us to understand it should have been one of the contacts of Birsa who had given away the information. On the 3rd of February 1900, Birsa was arrested when he was in the Chakradarpur forest and taken to the jail. 
he died when he was inside the jail on the 9th of june recently birsa munda's contribution has been well recognized in fact birsa was the first tribal leader who fought against the atrocities of the british authorities and his birthday of the 15th of november has been declared by the government of india as the jan jati ya gaurav divas the gaurav the honor of the tribals tribals who are the original inhabitants of this land and that is why his birthday has been declared the jan jati ya gaurav divas whom shall we see next from jharkhand area we now move to the land of the telugu people ng ranga or acharya ranga is a name that triggers respect in the minds of the telugu speaking people ng ranga was born as gokineni ranganayakulu on the 7th of november 1900 he was born in the nidbrolu village of the guntur district he belonged to a well to do family went to school and got educated well subsequently he even went to the oxford university to study economics when he came back to india he became a professor of economics at the pachepas college in chennai then madras it was in madras that he also happened to meet mahatma gandhi once he was attracted to the principles of gandhi there was no looking back and from 1929 his involvement in the indian national movement became complete he joined the civil disobedience movement and was part of several satyagrahas he led the agitation and the protest against the simon commission of course as an economist he also participated in the first round table conference in 1930 his involvement in the freedom struggle grew deep and that is when he wrote a book entitled bapu blesses bapu was the nickname of mahatma gandhi as we all know ranga wrote on the way bapu thought and the way bapu wanted all the people of india to join the freedom struggle ng ranga was also involved in the labor and the kisan movements in 1933 he led the kisan agitation of andhra pradesh he also led a protest against the venkatagiri zamindar in fact all these activities made him move closer to the farmers and the peasants and in 1936 when the indian national congress met at lucknow ranga was responsible 
to establish the All India Kisan Sabha. The All India Kisan Sabha was started during the Lucknow Congress Conference. Along with his wife, Bharati, he participated in several individual Satyagraha movements, in the Quit India movement and civil disobedience movement. Subsequently, after India acquiring independence, NG Ranga also became part of the Constituent Assembly of India. Before the country obtained independence, he was part of the political establishments in the region of Andhra Pradesh in 1930s and later. Ranga was also a very avid reader and writer. He had written on several subjects, but his favorite was agriculture and the peasant movement. Rightly so, N.G. Ranga or Gokineni Ranganayakalu is hailed the father of the Indian peasant movement. He was also one of the co-founders of the Swatantra Party and for his contribution towards the upliftment of the peasants of the country, towards the upliftment of the laborers of the country, the downtrodden of the country, Ranga is also hailed the Acharya, Acharya N.G. Ranga. Friends, we have been seeing about several of these leaders who had participated in the freedom struggle. It is also necessary that we know about some of the important incidences which were part of the freedom movement. We have been referring to some of these incidences as we had discussed the personalities who were involved in these incidences. Today, we shall try to see one such incidents or occasion. The importance of this incidence is that it is often recorded as the first state trial of any magnitude in India and that is the Alipur bomb case. The reason why we think of the Alipur bomb case today is that we should know about the involvement of several great leaders in this particular incidence and the way they have contributed to the country. We have already seen the Alipur bomb case was handled by Chitaranjan Das. Chitaranjan Das was the advocate, the counsel for Aurobindo Ghosh in this particular case. Why is it that some of the youngsters of those days wanted to get involved in revolutionary activities? In 1905, Bengal was partitioned. Immediately after the youth of Bengal, the leaders of Bengal, all those people who mattered in Bengal felt it was an unnecessary move and this unwarranted partition only led to mass agitation 
and mass protest. It led to a general outburst of revolt and this revolt resulted in the rise of a great nationalist movement. The British government responded to all these protests with very severe repressive measures and these measures were against the Swadeshi agitation. The nationalist leaders were Swadeshi in nature and the British authorities could not accept the Swadeshi movement. It was at this time that Aurobindo Ghosh, his associates and his brother Varindra Ghosh were all involved in some revolutionary activities. In 1907, two years after the partition of Bengal, Varindra Ghosh suggested to Aurobindo Ghosh to start a Bengali newspaper. Those were days when information could be spread or disseminated only through newspapers. There were no television channels, there was no electronic media and there were no gadgets as we have today for information to be exponentially disseminated people had to send information through writings, especially journals, magazines and newspapers. Aurobindo Ghosh agreed to his brother's suggestion and started the Yugantar. Yugantar, as we all know, has had an extraordinary role in the national movement. Barindra Ghosh also maintained a kind of a secret society with his friends. This revolutionary group was called the Maniktola secret society because very often Barin and his friends met at the property that they had at Murai Pukor, which is near Maniktola. Hence, the gardens at which they met was called the Maniktola Gardens and whatever that happened at the Maniktola Society was referred to as the Maniktola Conspiracy. As these youngsters were discussing Swadeshi, were discussing the importance of Swadeshi amongst themselves, they also understood that the British authorities were doing many more atrocities across the land. So, a kind of a militant nationalism arose. In their young blood, the youth thought they should kind of express their hostility in a revolutionary style and they targeted some of the British officers. The first target was Sir Andrew Fraser who was the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal. They tried some kind of an attempt on his life when he was travelling. However, that attempt failed. They tried one more and their target now was the mayor of Chandranagar by name L. Tardivel and that attempt also failed. They wanted to take vengeance against Tardivel because he prevented a Swadeshi movement from taking place. Today, we may not be able to understand the implications of such ban orders. But imagine, people could not meet, people could not talk about their country. Banning a Swadeshi meeting would mean 
the youth cannot meet the youth would not be in a position to discuss and they cannot bother about their own land when the first two attempts failed the attention of all those people who were there turned to another prospective attempt there was a magistrate by name douglas kingsford this magistrate was notorious for his judgments and orders he would simply pass an order of canning you know a cane and with that cane stick somebody would be lashed for a very small mistake just because the person who committed the mistake was an indian harsh punishments were given whipping 15 whip lashes a day 20 whip lashes a day 20 cane charges a day and so on so these people had a kind of hostility mounted up against the magistrate and so they decided that they would do something to the life of douglas kingsford two youngsters took up the responsibility one was khudiram bose and another praful achaki both khudiram bose and praful achaki surveyed the entire area they took stock of the movements of douglas kingsford where would he go where would he sit what would he do in the evenings and they decided that they would make an attempt at his life so on a particular day on the 30th april of 1908 they positioned themselves beside a tree across kingsford's house who positioned themselves praful achaki and kudiram bose baran gosh had chosen the two of them they waited for him for the magistrate to return from the club every evening douglas kingsford would go to the club and play along with his friends so now what happened from the club emerged two carriages and thinking that kingsford would be in the first carriage these two people hurled a bomb into that carriage there was a loud explosion and immediate commotion however the two young boys did not realize that the carriage did not carry douglas kingsford but it carried two other women what exactly had happened is that as they were in the club kingsford and his wife were playing with two other women one mrs kennedy and her daughter so when they left the club the two ladies got on to a carriage which was very similar to the carriage of kingsford and their carriage moved first and the carriage of kingsford came next when kudiram bose and praful achaki hurled the bomb thinking it was douglas kingsford emerging out of the club they were wrong in their assumption the bomb killed the kennedys and kingsford escaped unhurt however this became a kind of murder attempt this was against the british raj 
this was against the British Kingdom. So, in 1908, this created a great uproar. This became the Alipore Conspiracy. The incidents happened at Musafarpur, but then the case was transferred to the Alipur court. And that is why this was called the Alipur conspiracy. Of course, what happened to Kudiram Bose and Prafulla Chaki? The two boys tried escaping. They ran out of the gardens in which they were hiding. Of course, British police were immediate in their reaction. Prafulla Chaki was about to be caught and to escape from the hands of the British people, Chaki killed himself. Kudiram Bose escaped but then was subsequently caught and executed. When this case came to the court, because it was Barin Ghosh, who was the master brain behind the entire conspiracy or the so-called conspiracy, Aurobindo was also suspected. And Chitaranjan Das became the advocate for Aurobindo Ghosh and defended him. In that historic trial, the Alipore Conspiracy Trial. Chitaranjan Das made such wonderful defense statements that the entire judiciary of the country became so overwhelmed. With Aurobindo Ghosh in the box, Chitaranjan Das spoke thus, quote, That long after this controversy is hushed in silence, long after this turmoil, this agitation ceases, long after he is dead and gone, he will be looked upon as the poet of patriotism, as the prophet of nationalism and the lover of humanity. Long after he is dead and gone, his words will be echoed and re-echoed not only in India but across distant seas and lands. Therefore, I say that the man in his position is not only standing before the bar of this court but before the bar of the high court of history. Chitaranjan Das spoke thus about Aurobindo Ghosh. But as we look at it today, don't we realize, my dear friends, that all these freedom fighters were poets of patriotism. All these freedom strugglers were prophets of nationalism and lovers of humanity. Their voices do echo and re-echo in our land, in our minds and in our thoughts. The very occasion Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav reminds us of all those great men and women who have contributed to the freedom of this land. We enjoy the freedom today because of their contribution. There were many of them who died much before they saw the age of 30. There were many of them who lost all their property. Salem Varadarajulu Naidu lost his property 
because he refused to pay the tax as a protest to the arrest of Mahatma Gandhi. What did he gain? Nothing. Except that all these people will have to gain our respect. They have to gain our respect. You and me will have to think of each of these men and women and thank them every moment for what they have given us. There were any number of them. We had known some of their names. We do not even have records of some of the other people. One such whose name is not very well known was Ram Prasad Bismal. Bismal was born on the 11th of June 1897 and mind you, he died in 1927, just of 30 years of age. Bismal belonged to a place called the Shahjahanpur in the northwest provinces. There was a northwest province in the British Raj and in Shahjahanpur was born Ram Prasad Bismal. At the age of 18, he understood the way Indians were being treated by the British. And when he heard of the atrocities and the kind of punishments which were bestowed on Indians, he took his pen and wrote a poem called Mera Jan and gradually joined the Indian National Congress. He also established an organization called the Matri Vedi. Matri is to Mother India and Vedi is the altar, the altar of Mother India. He collected all his friends, the youth of the region and consolidated their strength into the Matri Vedi. He wrote several articles, published many pamphlets and distributed these pamphlets in his bid to raise awareness about the freedom movement. And for all these activities, they needed money. So Bismal and his friends thought of a unique way. After all, the British were exploiting and taking away all our wealth. They, they were taking our wealth, exporting it, importing it back in a different form and then reselling to our own selves. So these youth thought they should take away all that money from the British and use it for the country. So they indulged in some kind of robbery cases. One such robbery was the famous Kokori train robbery. A train was passing by a small little place called Kokori. It was on its way to Lucknow. And in that train were big chests, chests which were full of money money which was collected as tax from the poor peasants, collected and all that was being taken to be deposited to the British government. So on the 9th of August 1925, a bunch of youngsters got onto the train and decided to loot that particular chest which was carrying all the money. There were two of them, Ashwakullah Khan and his friend. Ashwakullah Khan had a pistol in his hand. They also had the others, some automatic pistols. 
Ashwakula Khan gave his pistol to one of his assistants by name Manmat Nath Gupta. They were not using the pistols at all, but then Gupta was so curious that he meddled with the pistol and triggered. This alerted the police and the police arrested more than 40 people in that particular incidence. A court case, a court trial came up and these youngsters were convicted. A Privy Council appeal was made which was rejected and after 18 months of trial proceedings, Bismil, Ashwakulla Khan and Rajendra Lahiri were given a capital punishment. Please remember, they were caught in the train and for that offence, they were given a capital punishment. And on the 27th of December 1927, Ram Prasad Bismal was hanged. Friends, we are not justifying violence. Let us remember that. But there was a time when these young men and women had to make their presence known by some kind of a revolt and revolutionary activity. Today we are happy, today we are peaceful, today we are in Satvik primarily because they showed all their Rajasa. Don't we have the moral responsibility of bowing down to them and saying Jai Hind, Jai Hind.